I was listening Dark. to Triple R on the way here. He was just talking about. He was actually talking about fungi. Yeah, like mushrooms. Huh? Like mushrooms. Like fungi. Um, I guess mushrooms, but just stuff that I guess fungi off trees, off whatever. Uh. And how? And how? If you think about our internet, and how there's you can communicate with anyone really through internet, through messenger, through whatever. Yeah. The same happens in the forest with the trees underneath. Mm-hmm. Yep. Everything connects together yeah. and that's how they communicate. Yeah. It's um it's called I believe it's called mycelium. It is. Yeah. Mycelium is a way that I can hear a lot that you knew that. Mushrooms communicate via each other. And it's it, it's interesting because it's like, well, plants they're not sentient beings mm. and creatures like mm. you know a farm animal or, or a dog or mm. any other animal mm. but i think we're, we're finding out that these these plants and mushrooms and fungi have some type of communication networks yeah. that are well beyond our previous idea 100 percent. and like it's like it, it, i think it might even become weirder the more we learn with where mm. you draw the line between a plant-based mm. and like a yeah like the ethics of it. Very true. Um, and then she went on to talk about that Obama was talking to David Attenborough and was like, how do we get people to enjoy land again? Like to enjoy um, getting out to the forest yes. and all that type of stuff. And, and David was like, well, the, probably the good question is, is why did they stop? Because when everyone's young, you put them out in the bush or whatever and they can have the best fucking time ever mm. for as long as they want. Whereas when you grow up and you've got so much going on in life you got stress you just forget about all that shit you're just stuck in your own little bubble and you just do that you don't think about oh let's get out and let's do shit you know what i mean it's like that gets replaced yeah it gets replaced with with more stress more anxieties yeah depression yeah i think those are the byproducts i think yeah. those are the byproducts yeah. of the sedentary lifestyle of mm. the the non-stimulating, adventurous, joy-filled, mm. nutritious lifestyle. What you got? What you got there? What food you got there? Man, I got rice. That's a fucking big container. <laughs> Jesus. Rice with roasted asparagus. Yeah. Brussels sprout. Love the vegetables. Tofu. Okay. Um, carrot. Uh huh. Um, beetroot. Bit of egg. Love the variety. And zucchini. Fuck yeah! You make that? Yeah, dude. Fucking. Made Chef Radliff Made it for the girls last night, you know The girls? Not just the girl? I live with two girls My girlfriend And then, um, well, my best friend is Well, one of my good friends, Jimmy But he's in Japan And then, um How are you girlfriend. with Jimmy if Jimmy's in Japan? Huh? You made it in Japan No yeah. How did you make it? F- he's in Japan No, well, I made it for the girls Jimmy's not here Jimmy's in Japan, dude <laughs> If I said the girls and Jimmy, it would have been Jimmy included. <laughs> Fucking Jimmy. Chuck these headphones off, man. Are you about to lock in? We're about to game? I fucking wish we were gaming right now, though. Really? Oh, shit, I can hear you. We talked about that on the last podcast. Um, gaming? Yeah, and how it's it's uh, a lot of people are addicted to it. Um, I was addicted, I reckon. Yeah? Grade 12, Call of Duty. Wow, What? which one? Probably one of the first modern warfare's, I guess. Mm. Man, it's it's. I I I understand it because it's like you enter another universe and like mm. everything else just disappears, mm. just like locked in. Mm. But like we were talking about just a minute a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, true. Like when people enter these new worlds of away from or in technology, obsessing with technology in another universe, they miss out on the beauty of our own universe. Yeah, and then. Then you get caught up with those byproducts. Yes. And what are those byproducts, Radliff? Right, stress, anxiety, depression. Did you experience any of that? Anxiety, definitely. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, university. Um, first, second year physio. A lot of placements, a lot of shit going on. Living out of home, you got to pay for everything to get through pretty much. Like, I had to go to Sydney for a placement, had to pay for my accommodation there, on top of my accommodation at home making no money like shit builds up builds up builds up then i got to a placement in a small town up north of sunshine coast it was like near Mackay or something like that and uh 
just one day I was on placement there and I kind of got real, real dizzy, nearly dropped down to the ground while I was trying to help a patient back to their room. I was just like, fuck, what's going on? Um, freaked me out a little bit. And from that day, started to have anxiety, have stresses. Hmm. Just from that. And I don't know if that was just, that day was just a little bit too much for me or it was a build up or something like that. But from then on, not as much now, because I've kind of got on top of it with certain things I do, but for a long time there. The ne- I reckon the next semester of university was the hardest for me. It wasn't, content wasn't hard, but mentally, getting up in front of people, speaking again, doing all that stuff. I pretty much went from like, say I was at level five, went back to level one. What do you mean level one? Just was was so anxious talking in front of people. Oh, level one is the top level that for you. The, yeah, it's the bottom level. Oh, bottom level of anxiety. Yeah, well, bottom level of my confidence when I'm speaking, Got doing it. that type of thing. It was a higher level of anxiety, everything like that. But yeah, just from that one moment that kind of put me over the edge, I was just like, fuck. Don't know, don't know, didn't know anything about anxiety before that. How did it feel? Because I think ang- everybody experiences anxiety, depression, all these things a little yeah. bit differently. Yeah. How do you describe that? I reckon it's a tough one to describe. It was just like every time that I had to go in a situation where I wasn't comfortable with now, I, I'd start to get sweaty, start to, my heart would start racing. Um, that, that little bit of dizziness would come back of that episode that I had. So everything went back to that episode, which was like, fuck, am I going to faint here? Um, mm. Do I need to sit down? So it's almost like that, that, that was like a, it's like a, how do I say? Like you thought back to that previous mm. situation, like yeah. almost let's anxiety attack, whatever yeah. you want to call yeah. it. Right. Yeah. And it kind of, it's like a cycle that yeah. makes it worse. Right. Cause you think you're going to get back there. You don't want to get back there, yeah. but yeah. then you, the symptoms get worse. Yeah. It's a cycle. And then when I started to think about it more, it just, I guess it, I'm going to sit forward. No, you're good. Oh. Be comfortable. Shit, dude. Um, the more I thought about it, then I, I figured out that all right, when I was younger, there was definitely signs of anxiety and stuff there. For example, I always played soccer, which is a team sport, which I loved and I was so comfortable in that environment. But when I would go to, let's say, track work and I'd be going in sprinting events or high jump events or whatever, there was, there was got to a point where I was, I got so nervous and scared that I just wouldn't go. Really? Yeah. I'd cry. Dad would be like, what are you doing? I'm yeah. like... I don't know. I'd, I'd go to a friend's house, stay overnight sometimes when I was real young. Um, would cry and come home. How old are you? Now? No. Then. <laughs> 20, 28 now. Uh, <laughs> 27 <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah, true. I think I would have been like grade six, grade seven. Yeah. So, I don't know, young. That's interesting. So you, you had this... I'd never thought about it like that back then, but now I do. I'm like, fuck, all right. What are you now reflecting on? Or what do you make of that? Why do you think... I don't know. That occurred. To tell you the truth, it's I don't know why I didn't want to be away from family or or I didn't want to do stuff by myself. I don't know if it's something that my parents just looked after me too well. I yeah, don't have a clue actually. It's a I think one. that's a thing. I think were you first born? Second born. Okay, second born. Well, I think any time a child is first born. I think there is a tendency for parents to not that you're first born, but I'm just mm. the principle of it applies. Mm. Uh, parents tend to have, be a bit more of a bearing, a bit more controlling, mm. a bit more like mm. uh, let's wrap him up in cotton wool a little yeah. bit. It's like you don't want to break your child, you don't want your child to get hurt or yeah. blah 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 blah. But I think when you when you don't expose that child, that infant to necessary pain, mm. discomfort, suffering, and the real world, mm. then by the time they're exposed to real life situations where they have to be uncomfortable, like a competition, mm. like when they're not alone and they're, well, they are alone and they're mm. by themselves on a field and they have to, what do I do? And they're not prepared and they, they break in some ways. Yeah, it's tough. Because when, and then when you say that, my parents are fucking so relaxed. Ah. So they like... Interesting. They don't, like dad was always away because he's playing sport mum was always kind of doing her thing working as well so we always had say a babysitter or we'd be going on trips with them or stuff like that so very family orientated yeah not as much now because everyone lives fucking everywhere but back then yeah but back when you then, grew up yeah and so now you've have you been able to conquer that 
no, no, that anxiety stuff? Um, largely was uh, meditation. Mm. Yeah. Breathe, motherfucker. Yeah. Helped me a lot. Um, Headspace. It's a great app. Got a uh, year membership on that a while yep. ago and when it was pretty bad, which this wasn't too long ago. This was probably three, four years ago, maybe three years ago. Um, and just every day we'd do it. I was just moving to Melbourne at the same time where, like, there's a lot of things that happen. So everything happened in that small space and then got on meditation, um, exercised a lot um, and just slowly kept getting on top of it, top of it, top of it. Now, pretty pretty good. Like, I got to a point where flying was actually... Flying was been easy for me my whole life. And then when I was in that anxiety state, flying got a little bit harder. But now I just got back from Japan. Flying's easy. It's fucking... Now, th- that's the thing. Because people get stuck. They get stuck in these anxiety cycles, though. Yeah. Like, how did you break that cycle? I, I think because I've got the background of exercise science, physio, I know the brain is so controlling. Yeah. It, it can pretty much... It can tell you something that you don't don't want to know pretty much. And because I know that and I understand that there's so many things that go into anxiety. It's not just, all right, let's take some pills. Let's start to feel a little bit better and see what happens. It's your surroundings, your environment. It's how you respond to anxiety. Anxiety doesn't have to be a bad thing. Anxiety can just tell you, all right, this, this is a bit of a different situation for me. It's like feedback. Yeah, it's feedback. It's like pain. Exact same thing. Yeah, pain. yeah. Pain's not a scary, or shouldn't be a scary thing. But for most people, especially being a physio, they come in with the smallest amounts of pain and they're fucking petrified. So it's mm. just me understanding, understanding what anxiety was, what works for me. What works for me is probably not going to work for everyone. Yeah. So for me, it was all right. Let's meditation. Let, let's exercise. Let's talk about it. Let's not just hide it in, um, hide it inside. Talking to my partner heaps, and she she would help out. That, that type of thing of just let's talk about it what's, what's been going on hmm. so I think just bringing it to the surface understanding it was probably the most important thing for me and you did I think it's, it sounded like you almost like rationalised not rationalised but you used logic and your, your learnings yeah. to kind of have that conversation with yourself and get past it because a lot of people they get very emotionally caught up in their mm. mental mm, negative destructive cycles but you almost used like what you had been learning to be like, no, I, I can control this. Yeah. You know. And I think that's the hard part for a lot of other people that don't have a background with involving the body pretty much. Yeah. That they, they think anytime they got pain, anytime they got anxiety, that, fuck, what's wrong with me? Like that it's out of the norm when it is the norm. Everyone's got pain. Everyone's got anxieties. It's just how you deal with it. Right. And, okay, there's like so, so many things to go from here, but it's like, Okay. there is like voluntary pain, suffering, discomfort that we expose ourselves to mm. through physical movement and activity mm. and challenging conversations, everything alike to that. And then there is like the unnecessary suffering and pain, like chronic debilitating physiological uh, issues that you will mm. see all the time. Mm. So how do we distinguish the both? And then it reminds me of a conversation that we had I don't know, a while ago, you know, that people's pain often is in their head mm. or that, do you remember that? Mm. So what were we talking about there? Were you, which side were you on? Well, we're just talking about how complex pain is pretty much. Yeah. And as we, as I said before, uh, our brain controls everything. You never tell someone that their pain is in their head, but it's just getting them to understand that pain is so multifactorial. Yeah. It's not just fuck, all right, this person comes in with lower back pain, um, your pain's coming from your lower back. That's, that's a real structural type thing. If they, Maybe if they fall off a cliff and they got and they land on their back, then we can say, all right. If it's a trauma, yeah, yeah, like a blood trauma. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But if it's something that, let's talk about chronic pain, which is something that occurs over that, that six, six months plus, yeah? We know stuff heals before then, all right? So why do people still have pain and why is their pain getting worse? So there has to be more reasons than just what's going what on. What do you that. see as the, cause you would have seen, how long have you been a physio for? Just over two years. Okay, and you finished your masters when? Um, 2017. Okay, so in that time though, you would have been exposed to heaps of heaps of people, right? Because I, I've seen you, you've also done, um, what was it, Gold Coast, what, what AFL team were you working Gold Coast Suns. Gold Coast Suns. Still work for them, but just 
Only the Melbourne games. Okay. So you would have seen a lot of people. What are those lifestyle factors, habits that you see the, the biggest contributors to people's chronic pain and even injuries? Well, if we, let's talk about general population. Yeah. Where theirs is just fear because they've, they've probably been told... this. All right, let's scale it back even more. When someone comes and sees us that's been... or sees me that's had chronic pain, they've probably seen a couple of health professionals before me. Yeah? Old school type mentality will be telling someone, all right, you've got a bulging disc or you've, um, you've got something serious going on in your back. I want you to rest. Yeah? So that's what they've had in their... It's a very passive approach. Yeah, that's, but, but it happens, still happens a lot. Yeah? They're, they're told to rest. Come and see me twice a week. That's what they're told. I'll give you a massage. I'll put some needles in you. I'll put an ultras... Whatever the fuck that they want to put on them. Can you chuck that phone behind you? Great. All right, keep going. You like that? No. Just us, just about us, baby. You put that computer somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> I could, but then nothing gets recorded. Man, this is just a t- chat. You know why? Because if that phone goes off... Boom, you zapped out of the conversation. Well, you just fucked my flow anyway. Yeah, did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back to the story. Lower back pain. Oh, lower back pain. Um, they're going through this chronic cycle early because they've been, they've been educated the wrong thing. They've been told to rest. They've been told to come see me, okay? They haven't been empowered at all. They've been told, all right, I'll look after you. Mm. They get to the six-month mark. Um, they're, they're scared. There's fear there, right? They've got... From that, they've got anxieties and stress already. They're not doing any exercise. Um, they're probably trying to keep their back in a certain position, which is just going to end up fatiguing them so much. So they're, they're just doing everything wrong. Yeah? And I think the one thing that comes down to is education. Because it's fear-based. Yeah. It's a very fear-based decision-making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, pain is your environment, your work environment, or your, your home environment, your work environment, so relationships, um, any stresses, anxieties, how you sleep, what you eat. Um, your exercise that's already eight things that comes into pain and that's in 10 seconds you just said yeah, yeah, yeah. we can keep going yeah, yeah so thinking about that and someone says all right well you i just want you to rest i don't want you to move that back too much i don't want you to bend i want you to go to work sit in that same position um go home fucking lay down take some pills and we'll we'll keep going week by week see what happens that's not going to help no, you're actually fulfill like it's a feedback loop that yeah. helps the physios yeah. make more money yeah. and stay in business yeah. while giving the illusion that the client is getting better temporarily. But if you look long term chronically, yeah. wait, I feel good for 24 hours, yeah. but after that, I just degrade back. Yeah. And I have to see my physio twice a week. I have to, because if yeah. I don't, yeah. then... I'm not, cr- well, you're not creating that temporary, it's what it is, a temporary yeah. neurophysiological response. Yeah. Right? But we're not getting to the root cause. No. And you'd see the same it's pe- a problem. people come in through, through the gym and they're like, yeah, I've got a shit back. You're like, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my physio, my chiro, my osteo told me that it, like, my back's fucked. So just do what I do. And what you can. already such like, ugh, when you hear something like that, like, damn, that's where we're starting from. You're starting with this hugely yeah. self-limiting, defeating thing. My back's yeah. fucked. No, you're not fucked. Yeah. Like, human beings are extremely adaptable. Yeah. And we can take a lot, bro. Come on. You got people jumping out of airplanes in the military every week, having huge compressive forces, and they're able to hike out dozens and dozens of kilometers, and then, prof- come on, man. Mm. I'm with you. That's where the whole stigma of a lot of physios or a lot of allied health under treat because not i don't think it's that they that they want to um hold people for any longer it's that it's safer they they find it safer that they're not gonna injure anyone while while they're going to the physio which is something that's i reckon is completely wrong right but it is, I think, that, absolutely yes. But honestly, I've and you, you've, you've you're in the industry, the physio industry. I'm not, but I've heard from physios that they do actually push for quotas. Like we aim for oh, a yeah. four to six repeat yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, but, mate, spot on. And that'll yeah. Uh, how do I say? That'll push that. 
yeah. kind of bad system. Yeah. Or well, they come in and say, all right, you got lower back pain. All yeah. right, we know that that's going to last four to six weeks. I want you coming in. Um, well, they'll push it out to, let's say, six, eight weeks. You've got to come in um, twice for the first four weeks. Um, if you're going, all right, we'll go once for the next... No, let's go twice for the first f- six weeks. Let's go once for the next um, two weeks, and then we'll see how you go from there. So they're, they're not individualising anything. Well, and this is just me talking, but they're not individualising. Um, they're just going off templates. What percentage of the, of the physiotherapy industry in Australia, you can even go to the world, do you think has that approach? That's a hard one. I think, I think, I don't know. I couldn't tell you because there's a lot of good physios out there. There's a lot of fucking fantastic physios out there that are doing the right thing yeah. um, and that are pushing this industry to uh, a good area. But just, I, don't, I can't put a number on it, just, but just the older ones that have been around for a while sure. or the ones that want to make more money or stuff like that, which happens in any industry, mm. um, but it just makes some of us look bad. Why, there's, one, there's a couple of industries where they're, they're pretty flooded, mm. right? Exercise science degrees pushing out trainers mm. and coaches. I would, I, I think there's an argument could be made. We probably don't need more coaches and trainers, mm. right? It's mm. probably another argument could be made that, I don't know, do we need more physiotherapists? There seems to be one, uh, one on every second yeah. corner in every suburb, mm. right? Do you think, do you have that thought? Well, it depends what area they're going to go into. Okay. I think I think sports. Uh, well, watching a professional game—that's why everyone wants to be a physio. Yeah, it's, it's it. sexy. Yeah, but you don't you don't have to go that way. You can work oh, yeah. in an aged care. Everyone's getting older, so it's good to have a physio in aged care. Uh, hospitals, everyone's getting living older, so they're they're getting sick a lot later in life. But there's still a lot of, a lot of people going into hospitals. Sure, physios are important in hospitals. Physio are important in aged care. Physios are important in rural areas as well, which yes. there's probably not enough of. So if we think outside sport, fuck yeah, there needs to be more physios. Okay. But the amount that go to sport... Yeah. Um, that's my context. Yeah, that that's that's where there's probably too many, of, too many of them. That's a great point. You know, especially the rural areas where we talk about underprivileged communities yeah. who don't... Then, you know, if you're lucky enough to live in a... a suburban moderately affluent area you have access to the resources and education to build your body and brain up to a to a really competent level but a lot of these rural areas that they're, they're, they're they don't even have the education no no which no. is yeah it's tough so that that's a that's a huge thing um why did you decide years ago to become a physio what what drew you into this thing yeah i think it was because it's a bit of a story, actually. Um, I came back from playing soccer over in the States. Mm. Uh, College? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Arizona. No, my family lives in Arizona. Oh, yeah. I was in Kentucky. You're, okay. Yeah. Remember when we had this conversation? Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. So your family's from Tucson. Well, dad's from Seattle. Ah. Yeah. Mum and dad moved to the States probably five, six years ago because dad came over and lived in Australia for a long time. Yeah. Um, Went back over, didn't lived in Seattle for a little bit or just outside Seattle, but because it rains and it's cold and mum was like, I don't think mum was keen. So they moved down to uh, Arizona. Warm, really warm. Mm. Goes from there. But I got back from the States. Uh, was like, fuck, what am I going to do? Mm. Uh, thought I was going to go into teaching, ended up going into exercise science. Probably second year into exercise science, my partner, um, her dad was like, I go to the physio all the time. He's a real good bloke. Do you want to come meet him? I was like, fuck yeah, let's meet him. Went out for a beer. Um, and he's like, you want to come hang out in the clinic? I was like, yeah, definitely. Started hanging out with him. And this is why I was still doing exercise science. Hold on. Did you have, did you know by then that you wanted to do exercise science or that you wanted to be a physiotherapist? No. Like what drew you to go to him? Because uh, I think we were talking at my girlfriend's house and it was just like, what are you, you going to do? What, what comes from after exercise science? And I was like, I'm not too sure. You can go on the physio, you can go exercise phys, you can go honours, like you can do so much. And he's like, well, I know a physio. Do you want to see if you want to be a physio? And I was like, yeah. So had a beer with him. Name's Tim Brown. He's still probably the best physio I've ever met. Really? Yeah. Tim Brown, where's he yeah. out of? Um, was in Mermaid Beach at the time, now in Palm Beach on the Gold Coast. Okay. Yeah. So went and had a beer with him, started hanging out with him. 
Um, we'd shadow him, say, every Saturday yeah. um, and just go hang out there for, say, three, four hours just to learn what he did. At the start, it was just more like just trying to understand what was going on because I didn't know too much about physio. Yeah. Yeah? I was like, he would just talk me through stuff. We'd talk about surfing. <laughs> we'd, talk about, we'd talk about a lot of things, actually. Um, and then I started hanging out with him. I hung out with another physio, which is probably another one of the best physios on the Goldie, named Richard Newton very similar to things so I was going through uh, exercise science at this phase and I was already um, shadowing people for physio from them too I decided all right let's try and get into physio Um, got into physio kept shadowing Tim Brown and that's the first Tim Brown's the first person for me that started to make me think about pain the pain science so there's more than just what's going on in that structural area it's it's the pain science everything behind it the it, bra- how the brain's linked yeah, to it yeah right. he, was, he was the first one that talked to me um, because every time you go through physio school and you think your hands on a fuck yeah this is how I'm fixing people Tim was the first one that talked to me about it's not that you're structurally changing something it's in the nervous system that will make an effect mm. that we're starting to start in, starting to make them feel different about pain all their knowledge of pain is starting to change and that's by putting hands on, by education, by exercise, all that type of stuff. But he, he would say, if you're just putting hands on, you're just giving them a massage or mobs or whatever, you're structurally not doing anything. Yeah? It might make them feel better, and that's when the nervous system comes involved. So I want to get back on that. Keep telling your story, yeah. but I want to comment on that. That was pretty much the story, man. I'll start the rant, I think. Oh, okay. So that's how I got into physio, Tim Brown. But you did your, but you did your exercise science, and so working with... The, Tim Brown and these physios shadowing yeah. them that made you think alright I'm going to do a ma- uh, yep, masters, masters yeah, in yeah. physiotherapy yep. so you already decided basically off that experience yeah okay done yeah now what were you just oh I just forgot nervous system yes so that's it what was what is the utility you think then of myotherapy of massage because I know you you don't personally like to do a lot of it um, for your obviously your own personal reasons you can get mm. into but what do you think the utility of Massage is, and then that trickle down effect. What is the utility of the foam roller, the lacrosse ball, mm. the massage gun, etc., mm. etc.? Et I think. Well, when we're putting our hands on or any of that stuff, we're we're affecting the nervous system. Yeah. So we're not structurally changing anything. We're not loosening muscles. We're not doing anything of that. But it goes down to how we affect the nervous system. If that if that's from someone's past experience, if someone said, let's say they've got a Let's just go lower back, it's easy. Um, and they've got massaged and they um, got someone's elbow dug into their glutes and that fixed it. They're going to go for that every time. That's the same someone down in the gym. If they were tight through the hamstrings, if that is sit, shit session, next session they rolled out and had a real good session, they're probably going to roll out every time. Just because of that association? Yeah, because that association. And that's their past experience that's coming onto this. So obviously that foam roller affected their nervous system so they had a really good session same with the, the gun thing or the lacrosse ball or whatever if it helps someone they're going to do it again if someone sees me at a physio clinic and i spend a session um, just hands-on let's say i do a whole hands-on session and um, they're fixed they'll next time they get injured they'll come straight back to me if if i do that a whole hands-on session and nothing changes and they had a terrible time they'll never come back to me yeah, they probably won't. Um, they won't want hands-on probably again. They want to try something different. But I think a lot of the stuff that we see people do is from their past experience, or what a prof- someone professional's done, or blah blah blah. It's 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 affecting the nervous system, and that's how they're gonna improve their performance, or blah blah blah. Is there a duration? I've read, fuck. A lot of research on the on the utility of stretching, dynamic and static, on its benefits and how the warm up can influence the quality of the preceding movements, right? Mm. But when we talk about changing tissue properties, because uh, I know you said it's nerv- mainly nervous system, but are there any tissue properties that we're changing? Any like I've heard um, Trevor Bachmeier talk about how we. We're changing the viscoelastic properties of the tissue. We could be talking about the fascia superficial. Mm. Um, if there are any changes that you see, how long would they last? And or how long would the nervous system changes last? Mm. I think that's a super hard one to answer. Mm. Um, 
Because I'm not the... I don't really care if someone stretches or they don't stretch. Um, I know that that stuff, if it's paired with strength, fucking perfect. If it's not paired with strength, they're only going to have short-term effects. Yeah. Yeah? I don't know exactly how long. Uh, and I don't know if it's affecting more than the nervous system. Um, but... Yeah, I just kind of, through warm-ups, and this could be not the answer you want, but through warm-ups, I just let people do their thing. If, if they want to stretch before, if they want to foam roll before, go for it. Because, you, and I think it comes down to, I think what you said before, if they find a value from it. Yeah. They find a tangible, yeah. positive effect from it. Yeah. It's like Jay uh, talked about on Friday with one of his athletes. She'll yeah. foam roll for 25 minutes. And that's probably because... She had a real good session after she foam rolled for the first time or whatever. And now she needs to foam roll every area and that's where she's going to make a difference. Yeah, it's like people get stuck in routines and they yeah. it's, it's like a uh, superstitions that, yeah. that we have. Yeah, exactly. Although, how much of it is now like a placebo thing yeah. versus actual real yeah. change? Yeah. How do we measure that? We, on the individual level, you yeah. can't really. No, and... and Every study should be N equals one anyway, which means everyone should be studied differently. Yeah? We got all this research coming out where, all right, the Nordic's going to be the best exercise for your hamstrings. Should we put everyone doing Nordic's or should we individualize that and say, this person's going to do way better on a super maximal RDL or something like that rather than let's get them on Nordic, something like that. Everyone's just got to be individualized. So every study should be N equals one. And then we can figure out what's going on. But we do, I think, but we do want, I mean, we're trying to standardize things, right? They're trying to create. But that's what you have to do with research. Right. We're trying to create ranges and represent average populations so we can make confident assertions. Yeah. But what you do with that research, exactly like you said, should be applied on a subjective individual. You're your own human being. We all have a lot of similarities, but we all have differences. Yeah. How do you think about that with your, with your clients? Exactly that. You just, I think you start everyone on similar playing fields. Like a foundation? Yeah, yeah. let's just say my ACL rehab. You start everyone on similar foundations, yeah? But one person might go one way and the other person might go the other way, yeah? If we need a, if someone's struggling with a pattern, we'll stay on that pattern for a lot longer, trying to figure out ways where we can supplement that. We can do different things. Whereas someone else, you could just be going, they could already have, they could have done a prehab. So they could be with you for three months before that where they know that patterns and you can just go straight off to a different way. So everyone kind of, I guess, starts, but through past experience, through their previous training, through their education from different physios, different allied health professionals, whatever, that's where we can figure out where to go. You talked about ACL, but that reminded me, and that's why I was trying to pull something up. Um, have you ever looked into or read about stem cell therapy or regenicine for bulging discs and spinal injuries? Have you dipped your toe into any of this? No, nah, not really. I'm a pretty conservative person. Mm. So, like, um, I'll send someone for a surgeon um, opinion if need be but I'm probably one of the last ones that would do that I like to try everything else before starting to think about injections or starting to think about everything like that I think people push too much for that stuff especially with let's just go back to lower back bulging disc how do we know the bulging disc is causing their pain how do we don't know people people get an MRI and see that oh that, this person's got a bulging disc this must be the reason why we've got lower back pain Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm super conservative so I, I would just go exercise and education over everything it doesn't have to be them being in the gym it can be them going doing some Pilates doing yoga going yep. for a walk going yep. for a bike ride but I'm just pushing that for a long period of time yeah people want to get fixed in a week or two yes people don't understand that it's going to take three, six, nine months because it, if it took ten years to fuck yourself it's going to take some time to yeah. unfuck yourself yeah but people seeing a physio want to be, or any allied health professional, want to be fixed in that one week, two week, three weeks. What do you do to communicate to, to the client to kind of, because that's step one, because a lot of people think very short term, they're like, all right, I'm going to pay for a couple of sessions. It's a couple hundred dollar investment, but like, sorry. Yeah. Like if you really want long lasting change, this is, this is a, this is a quite a large financial yeah. investment. Yeah. But 
it's it's changing your whole physiology and how you inter- how how you live. Yeah. So how do you communicate that? Education at the start. Yeah. If if you get them to understand that, look, you're not going to get better quick. Yeah. This is going to be. Uh, it's going to take some time, and you're going to have to work hard. I'm not doing any of the hard work. You're working hard the whole time. Yeah. If you can educate to them real early that this is going to be a long road. Let's just go back to my all my ACL clients, that this is going to be yeah. a long road. And if you're not working hard, it's going to be a lot harder for you. Yeah, You're going to be struggling for a longer period of time. You're going to be limping. You're going to have muscle atrophy. You're going to be not enjoying it for a long period of time. But if you get in there, you work hard, you get your sessions in, you start to understand that, all right, I'm going to be working here for 9, 12, 16 months, whatever. These is what I got to tick off. This is what it's going to look like when I get to the top. I went to a uh, course over the weekend um, by a fella named Ender King. He's, um, I think, it's from over in Ireland. Um, and the one thing, everyone, everyone in um, in a course, every presenter goes back to their their main thing a lot. And his thing was, what's your athlete going to look like when they get top at the top of the mountain? Tell them that day one, so they know what they got to get to. Yeah. Yeah. To work towards. Yeah. If you're constantly saying, all right, 12 months, you're going to be ready. If they get to 12 months, they're like, why aren't I ready? And you're like, give me another four weeks. And then give me another four weeks. They're just going to tell you the fucking good stuff. So you would do, so from my understanding, he's, he's talking about, let's describe what you will feel like, what you will look like. What tests you got to pass, what, what, what you've got to be able to do. Yeah. Let that be competency rather than a saturation. Yeah. Because, and I think, the first guy who really kind of showed me and like someone we personally know and I personally know that, hold on, you can recover from an ACL, a repeat ACL in a relatively short duration compared to the norm is Shandor Earl, NRL mm. player. Mm. So he got his ACL recovery done in about six months, mm. right? And he was back to training and playing, mm. which was really uh, kind of it broke a mental um, norm. Mm. And so this idea of like 9, 12, 16, well, yeah, it mm. depends, obviously. Mm. But wh- how far can we push this, do you think, ACL mm. recovery, well, rehab? I think it really depends who the person is. For someone that's a professional athlete, they're going to have to push a lot harder. But saying that, they've got the, a resources. good team around and yeah. they've got resources and they can work every day. Yeah? Not everyone, not everyone has the resources and that not everyone has a gain of getting back in six months you know what i mean the motivation well the gain what i mean by oh, that is what are they going to get from it yeah he's gonna he's gonna be able to play he's gonna get paid more he's gonna keep sponsorships blah yeah. blah blah yeah. whereas average fella just playing let's say average female just playing netball just for fun she i wouldn't get her back in six months no way because there's, there's no there's no reason to she's probably may get re-injured we know everything below any time after nine months there's a re- there's a large reduction in that you're going to re-injure but before nine months we know that the injury risk is quite high to what type of graft is that based on do you know the details of that it doesn't matter what type of graft is um yeah it doesn't matter what type of graft why uh, doesn't it matter though um because it's all about their rehab so i don't care if someone gets a hamstring graft a quad graft or a patella tendon graft they're all going to do the job if you've got a good surgeon they're going to do the job and you're going to be fine. Why is that so debated then? Uh, because it's just preference. Because uh, different, obviously, muscle groups have different motor unit, muscle fiber strength, mm. um, and, and like tolerance. Mm. So based on that, is there a way we can test? Like, okay, this would be best for you? I think it's, I just say whatever the surgeon's preference is because mm. what they've done more of they're probably going to be better at right so you're talking you're, talk, you're more like alright what is the success of a quality graft going to be well I think it's more the rehab if they uh, okay if if we let's say they got a hamstring graft and they got a large difference in hamstring strength nine uh, months down the track that's our fault yeah because you got to work around that you have to be able to intervene well there. it's just like a, a a tear in their hamstring we're going to work hard getting that hamstring we're going to work it isometrically eccentrically isotonic like we're going to work everything mm. um, if they've still got a large deficit in nine months that's a rehab fault that's not a fucking surgeon fault 
that's a rehab fault yeah because we didn't get them strong enough got it yeah yeah so i don't care uh, what graph they do we've just got to change a little like change things slightly depending on what graph they get a patella graph we know that they're probably going to have a little bit more anterior knee pain throughout rehab yeah so we've just got to work on technique a lot more say through their front squat or through their goblet squat or whatever so they're not getting that anterior knee pain if they do uh, that's a rehab fault and we just got to change it up yeah if they get a quad graft we know um, from all the research that there's a lot of trauma that goes on through um, the quads anyway through um, surgery so we just got to focus harder on the quads let's get it going let's get it going start early get that leg straight um, and let's get some pretty much muscle bulk coming back yeah so if 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 there's large deficits it's a rehab fault it's not it's not a surgeon's fault yeah you know what i mean i respect that because you take the onus of yourself it's like it's our responsibility yeah and that's great because then we're in control yeah we're not blaming yeah it's like all right and you learn from that and you get better exactly the way that um ender um described it at the course was um there's a lot of uh what he described as dead soldiers for him to be where he is now so a lot of people that he probably didn't do the right thing well the the best thing for them throughout rehab but he's learned from it yeah but that's it's kind of how you partly become really great at something isn't it 100 percent. but at the same time can we learn from like you are you learn from those people and be like okay maybe we don't have to make those mistakes yeah, yeah. have less dead soldiers myself yeah improve the quality of my coaching and uh physiotherapy yeah and so the question i have is like all right we have your the nepal player example you know we're not going to push it we see the we certainly we can see nine months that we can uh, after the nine month period you said we have what was the we just got an exact um uh, but it was a reduced significantly reduced rate like 50 percent, something high yeah something high of acl re-injury yeah okay now, the question is, for me, because I'm always trying to think, all right, how, how can we, efficiency, effectiveness, could we get to that point? How do we get to that point earlier? Eight months, seven months, six months. What do you think intervention-wise we can do, whether it be technology, whether it can be different rehab methods, recovery mm. methods? I just think you've got to do the... Just do the foundation right early. People are scared to... This is where underload comes back in. Physios are scared to load people yeah. up early. They're afraid of yeah, a little bit of pain. Especially ACLs. Because you see an ACL in sport and you're like, fuck, all right, this, that's a traumatic injury. They're out for ages. Um, but if we start to load people up earlier, get them into their, their bottom-up squat, top-down squat, goblet squat, whatever, get them into a front squat, start working those squats hard. If they understand the foundations early, then we can start to build it up. Saying that, I still... Right now, and this is just my opinion, I don't want to push it any any faster anyway. I, w- I want to. S- I don't mind having them for 12 to to 16 months or whatever because they're going to be as strong as I've ever been. They're going to have good mechanics. Mm. They're going to learn how to run. They're going to learn how to change. They're going to learn everything. Yeah, and that comes down to an ACL. Any, any, let's just say, keep on ACL, but any uh, ACL client needs to be with uh, a physio, a strength coach, an osteo, whoever that has the knowledge, facilities, and time. If you're spending 15, 20 minutes a week with your ACL, giving them just a, a plan and say, all right, go do this, they're not gonna, they're gonna struggle. Because there's no accountability in there? Well, they just, you just need to have like what we do here. I've got an hour with the ACL guys or girls. Um, I can talk them through everything, yeah? We can go through every single exercise. We've got an hour. We can talk on those breaks about anything that they're worried about. Then I get them to start working together. Yeah, multiple ACLs, we go out to the field. I get them to understand uh, how to run properly, what acceleration looks like, what max velocity looks like, what change directions look like, yeah? You see most people that they get to their, let's just say they get to their nine month mark and then um, someone will say, all right, you're good to, you're good to go back into um, training now. But they've only done gym exercises. They've probably done some landing and stuff like that, which is based gym anyway. Um, but they haven't got out and ran. They haven't got out and 
understood what acceleration feels like, what max velocity. Why do we do max velocity? If they get a hamstring graft, they should be fucking doing max velocity because it's going to increase that strength of the hamstring and they're not going to get a hamstring strain when they go back. Yeah, so there's so many things that we need to keep them here for anyway. So we don't need to push, 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 push. Let's find reasons why we can get them out in six months. The elite are going to get back in six months, which is perfect. But If we all had access to elite resources yeah. and, and facilities, then... Yeah, we'd all probably be around there. Yeah, and if you got to work with them every day. Yeah, have super super hands on. Yeah. Okay, really interesting. Um, what is the pain tolerance? So if someone does their ACL. People are usually super conservative and afraid to experience pain. But I think one of the best questions that I've learned to ask. I don't know if I got it from you. I got it from somebody. Was like, all right, is it pain, discomfort, soreness, or fatigue? Mm. Like we have to distinguish the mm. category that where it's describing because people the self-awareness of yeah. what they're feeling yeah. they might the intention is one thing but um perception is another yeah. so on that topic what's your tolerance that you allow of those categories of pain discomfort soreness fatigue especially pain yeah yeah well when they if they've got discomfort or anything like that i, I just said perfectly fine mm-hmm. don't, don't i don't care about discomfort or any of that at all pain yeah. um you're gonna have to work through pain yeah yeah, I had uh, ACL this morning. Um, we started to change exercises up or just more intensity through the exercise and it was starting to get some tightness and pain through that front of the knee. Um, and I just talked to him about it and said how normal these low levels of pain are. So anything, let's just, if we go on a scale, anything below uh, three or four, I'm fine with. Yeah, if it starts to get super irritable, if it starts to swell up, become tight stuff like that and it's quite painful then all we've done is we've just done too much that session yeah we haven't fucked anything we've just pushed it a little bit too hard and that's a good thing because we know we know what level that person's yeah, at yeah and then we can say all right well pain, we're going to use pain as a friend yeah pain's going to tell us if we do too much yeah if you got nothing at all we can press a little bit hard if you're a little bit sore then that's probably the level we're at and if you start to swell up, you're in a bit of pain, you're starting to struggle, then we push you too hard. That's one of the best things I think you've taught me when I was dealing with uh, one of my ex-clients who had a hamstring tendinopathy and it was, you know, you'd get flare-ups, mm. all right? And there's psychological trauma that happens with the flare-up. You're like, fuck, even as a coach, but more so as a client, it's like, mm. damn, I'm here again. But you explain this idea of low tolerance. Mm. Now we have to find, and that's a fluctuating dynamic thing mm-hmm over a course of months and years yeah. and we have to find the low tolerance for the the previous four weeks and, and the future yeah. as well yeah and it's this idea of like well you could probably explain it better but like how do you find that low tolerance well i think it's just listening to your body yeah we know with um tendinopathies in that in that hamstring case was if that person did too much the next in the day post 24 hours yeah. yeah yeah look at your 24 hour cycle yeah if, if 24 hours later they're struggling then they've obviously done too much. Yeah. yeah. Start to, or they've done an incorrect exercise or they've got more compressive load on that tendon or whatever. You've just got to listen to your body that 24 hours later. But I reckon that's one of the most important things. A little bit of pain throughout um, the session is fine. Mm. Yeah. Once they warm up, especially if tendon obviously, they're, they're going to be all right. Once yeah. they warm up, they feel, they feel like good. they can do whatever. Yeah. But then the next day, that's when it hits them. And they're like, fuck, I'm so sore. And then psychologically for the next session, they are yep. hesitant yep. Um, and reserved. Yeah. And that person that you're talking about, that, that person was someone that was, as soon as I gave them the right information, the right education, everything changed. Wasn't, I, don't, I think it was for maybe a different injury or a flare-up of that same injury, but as soon as I gave that person the right education and told them, no, nah, let's get back into it. Let's start lifting. Let's just change a couple things up. They were fine. Yeah. Yeah, so... Tendinopathies is, again, affecting the nervous system, yeah? So we've got to find ways, if that's through education, if that's different exercises, if that's just changing up your tempos or whatever, you can, you don't have to be fancy. Mm, and speaking of that, you and a couple other people, they introduced me to like how powerful tempo is for tendinopathy. Mm. Any joint, mm. any any area, mm. like long eccentrics, isometric holds are so yeah. analgesic benefits. Yeah. yeah. How amazing is that? Yeah, and you see a lot of a lot of coaches are using that at the start of their sessions. If yes. They, if they've got someone that has just say knee pain that comes and goes, mm. they'll just do um, 
they can do a wall sit, they can do um, a split squat hold, oh, yeah. something like that. So great. Yeah, just to, for that analgesic effect. So they can, throughout the rest of the session, they're feeling pretty good. And that's what you can do with 10 offices as well. Start of their session, yep. do the ISO work. Uh-huh. After the ISO work, get into your normal program. It's almost like the the ISO work and the, and the, the warm-up pre before the, the maximal or the more maximal mm-hmm. movements, it almost is like a metaphor for me. It's like we're creating like a uh, protection mm. around. I know it's not maybe technically what's happening, but it's almost like we're, we're now improving the effectiveness and efficiency of that system to absorb force, produce force, um, transmute force. Like it's now can function better just through that tempo work. Yep. And it's like... Yeah, I think it builds a little bit of confidence in people as well. Once they start to move around, they're like, "Oh shit, I'm not in, not in pain. I don't have any discomfort right now." They'll start to not be as hesitant throughout a session. They'll yeah. start to move quite well, and they can get in positions where they hadn't been able to get into it for a while. So it's just a way, an easy way, um, that you can get someone feeling pretty good throughout the tendonopathies. And saying that, you don't always have to use it isometric. It won't work for everyone. Isos don't work for everyone. Yeah. Some people, you just got to get them into the gym, get them moving pretty well. Um, and then over time, they'll start to feel pretty good anyway. There was a tempo prescribed by, I think it was a female researcher. Do you remember the one you use? Ebony Rio, probably. A- that's her name. Yep. Ebony Rio. Mm. Do you remember what she prescribed? I think for, uh, it was like five by 45 seconds. So it was real long durations of ISO work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and depending on what it was... Yeah, I, I reckon for most of them, she went 5 by 45 actually. Um, and that's, that's the early stages. You want to get off ISO as soon as possible. There's a guy named Peter Meliaris as well that I went to one of his courses a while ago now. And he's like, um, ISOs for a main exercise, you need to get rid of them as soon as possible. You can use them in a warm up just to try and get that analgesic effect, but you want to get to your isotonic type work, your heavy, slow resistance, start to build that capacity up. Right. Yeah. That's when I got a message the other day from a guy that shadows me here. And he's and he was he just become an osseo and his one of his clients was saying that they've been told to rest for he's been resting for a couple of years now with an Achilles tendinopathy. What? And he's got no change. Nothing. So, so obviously, yeah, very minimal. I think he just said the last person who saw him told him to just rest. So you got to understand how important load is yeah. for those type of injuries. The tissue will not adapt and change for the better if we do not load it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand how that's helpful at all but like even from like a swelling inflammatory perspective even if you get an uh, like it's an acute mm. trauma injury even within that first week you got swelling and you know you're getting a lot of uh, macrophages and inflammation to the area a lot of immune system flare up mm. it's not bad mm. it's not bad and this is where I'm of the uh, the perspective now of like icing for that reason I, I think it's extremely detrimental mm. especially based on the things that i've been learning from like kelly star the people he's been interviewing and i've been passing some of that on to you just because you know you're in the field like i haven't watched it yet yeah i bet because we went for like 51 minutes bro <laughs> how you take you to drive home that's 30 minutes 40 minutes drive home true is it on a podcast or is it just on youtube it's on youtube but you can play that and just chuck it on the seat damn son true I'm going to suffocate all of the, all the excuses. But do you don't listen to podcasts? Love podcasts. Come on, son. Then you're all good with it's it. 51 minutes. I love a good podcast. Well, on the icing. Mm. From now, and I got, like, I'm a, I'm a crazy note taker. And I like, I, I'm just, because I just, it helps you pass out, like, the, uh, the details of the information. Mm. And, and the benefits of, like, all right, what are the pros and cons of, of icing and, and, and and what what, do, what can we do instead? Mm. Have you looked at any of the stuff I sent you or what are your current thoughts and perspectives on the utility for icing? Well, what about what you said just before where you want that healing process to occur? So that that's probably one of the main reasons why you would not ice. Yeah? Mm-hmm. You can you can let that swelling occur, you can let that the start of regeneration start to happen pretty much. Um, which makes complete sense. Yeah? I'm not the biggest Again, I don't get fancy at all. If the person enjoys icing and they think it makes a difference, go for it. See, I would I would step in and be like, 
education like because there is if it depends what we're talking yeah, about yeah. though if we're talking about psychological benefit and jumping in an ice bath jordan yeah. potts style yeah, yeah you know jordan potts yeah right that man fucking loves yeah. his ice bath and i love the fucking wim hof man yeah oh hell, <laughs> hell yeah hell yeah ice man baby but the breathing yeah, and yeah. the endocrine benefits yeah. hormone benefits the psychological benefits mood regulation stress down regulation i fucking love all of that mm. it just uh it's a shame because now i can see and now it's really stacking up the evidence for repeat ice exposure mm. reduction in hypertrophy yeah okay like, makes sense yeah but you know now it's like research paper after research paper it's like damn okay that's that's a bit annoying because I, I do want to ice for those benefits but you don't yeah you can still i think you can still ice for different reasons such as such as reducing um oh just a different type of meditation to reduce your stresses your anxiety yeah th- yeah those reasons absolutely yeah. love that yeah. but then okay let's be tactful like if you if you care yeah about reductions in hypertrophy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Then let's take it maybe far a bit further away from the session. Mm. Maybe let's take it on an off day or something. Yeah, okay. You know, because I'm not the extreme guy of like just like, all right, don't ever ice or mm. don't ever sauna or don't ever this mm. or don't ever that. Nah, man, have a fucking donut. Mm. Nah, man, have have your ice mm. and eat it too. <laughs> you know. Fucking uh, yeah. But do you know the guy? Um, I got his name here, Dr. Gabe Merkin, who no. did who did he created the rice protocol? Yeah. Right. The the is it rest ice compress elevate? You got it. He's gone back on what he said. Mm. He now doesn't agree with it and disagrees with what he said. I can, it's I can give you a quote if quote. you would want, but I just think it's quote it. This is he's a Harvard physician, right? Um, it's still taught in medical and physical therapy schools today. It's listed on the National Institute of Health website as the top treatment for both acute and chronic sports injuries, which is. After reading, after learning about all this, it's like, ah, oh, shit, should it really be? Um, now, even Merkin now disagrees. These days, he tells anyone who will listen that he was wrong about both rest and ice. My rice guidelines have been used for decades, but new research shows that rest and ice actually delay healing and recovery. The man, oh, damn, he's 84 now. Um, he says, if your muscles are sore, you can relieve the pain with ice. And yes, we know ice is absolutely a pain analgesic reduction, mm. 100%. But inflammation causing the soreness and swelling is actually bringing healing to the body. And by icing, you dampen that immune response. He says, you think you're recovering faster, but science has shown you're not. And then I can go on. But I like that. Yeah. But how brave is that mm. for a guy mm. to be like, all right, I'm in my 80s but, and I'm in my 70s. but I'm gonna, And I created this huge protocol that the world knows. But guys, I didn't have all the information. Mm. I like it. How open-minded is And it's is probably that? something that I'll start to think about more now. And I'll probably listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> or I've just got all my information from you right now, so I'm good. Do you want me to keep going? Hey, I liked it. You can keep going. Um, I get... Because I can basically... You don't even have to watch it if I... Uh, I can summarize some of the stuff from those videos. Gary uh, Rennell. Have you heard of him? No. All right. Um, and th- this was the interesting stuff that I, that I heard from him and a couple of other sources about f- how fluid and swelling. And uh, so first question is, why are we icing? Like a goal with injury is to prevent further loss and regenerate tissue that's been damaged. So the question is, how does icing heal that pro- help that process? I mean, do you have an answer to that? Because he says it doesn't. Yeah, well, what I, I guess the reason why people die is just to reduce that swelling to... Right. And, and if you're juicing swelling, you, well, if you've got swelling, you've got more muscle inhibition. If you've got muscle inhibition, you can't use those muscles. Yeah, right? So the reason I think why people are icing is to get rid of all that swelling so they could start to stimulate those muscles again, get moving, don't lose too much muscle bulk, and then get going. I think that was, that was the reason why, or well, what I think, why people, why people ice. Yeah, to get rid of that. What's saying if we want to focus more on the, the healing process and get everything regenerated properly then icing shouldn't be a thing. But I think that that's why I thought people would ice. Right. That that definitely, that's a rationale that makes like a logical sense. But then the the, the counter uh, kind of jumping ahead is that, well, what's going to be much more effective than deadening the area, reducing the, uh, the immune response and, and healing properties like macrophages to the area? Mm. Well, swelling and fluid retention, it's is controlled by the lymphatic system, mm. right? And so 
a lot of them are what i'm hearing consistently is like we need movement we need to facilitate the lymphatic system mm. right and the lymphatic system is done through you need movement you need this pump and relaxation yeah. right if you can't contract the muscle voluntarily you can't take the joint through a safe range of motion you take it what with what you can and number two is that muscle stim yeah muscle stim and yeah. it's like I just my one of my clients had a lung pneumothorax, right? Yeah. Basically, his lung collapsed, yeah. um, and he can't do anything for two, three weeks. So I'm like, this is the third time now. So all right, let's do this. This is the first time with me, but third time, let's do this right. Muscle stim. We know it's going to decrease muscle atrophy, yeah. and which is huge because that's yeah. what we want, and that's that can have same effects with uh, any type of injury. We have a lot of inflammation, and we can do it early. Yes. So, like an ACL, mm. do you do you apply yeah, yeah, yeah. muscle stim for ACL? Uh, yeah, quads. Like, fuck yeah. Yeah, straight away, because it's a way that you can just get those muscles stimulated, muscles activating, pretty much day one, day two, day three. Yeah, I got here. Uh, activating muscles around the damaged site facilitates angiogenesis, which, if you remember, is the formation of new blood vessels. Blood vessels helps recapillarize. Uh, and recreate kind of new blood vessels and, and capillaries, which is going to stimulate blood flow to the area and heal yeah. it. That's what we want. Yeah, 100%. No. And that's being used. I, I don't use it too much on, let's say, just on a, um, a just an ankle roll or something like that, which which I, I probably should. Um, but ACLs, that's something that's been used for a while. And a lot of people do use it for any injury straight away. The one thing I don't know is like, excuse me, Kelly Starrett, do you know of him? Oh, you don't? I don't, oh, know, shit. I don't know many people, dude. I know you, I know. <laughs> people. Do you actually? Do you actually, like, you, you're pretty like, insular with the amount of kind of exposure? Um, yeah. I know certain people, but I don't, like, go to this person, that person, yeah. that person, that person. I, yeah. I've got a pretty tight little... Tight circle? ...following that I like to Fair. keep. Kelly Starrett, I would recommend. He's, he's, he's a doctor. He's actually a physical therapist, for, uh, comes from that background. He specializes um, in his understanding of mobility, movement, tissue, recovery, and like he's, he's, he's fucking brilliant. But um, he talked about his daughter had an injury. This is just N of one, but, but him using it with his daughter who was in a, in a cast or a sling, mm. she was muscle stimming hours and hours every day. Mm. And then I'll hear the other examples of people like really hitting it hard. The package might say do it every second day because they, mm. they don't want it, they want to be liable for anything just in case. But it seems like muscle stimming for hours every day is super effective for like a, a non-painful activation of the muscle to help mitigate atrophy and basically effectively uh, move the lymphatic system. Mm. But do you have a protocol for it? Because I don't, I don't hear it. No. How do you figure out how long to do it for? Just see what happens. We got to test it. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not doing you any damage. No, and that's the thing. I, is it? No. No. Big thunder, baby. Yeah, the, no, Love it's not, that. It's not doing any damage. Um, obviously, if you do too much, it's just like an exercise. If you do too much, you're going to come out sore you're going to come yeah. out fatigued that's probably yeah. swelling that type of stuff and i think you've got to think of muscle stim that way you only use it really early and you don't need to use it once the person can do stuff you just chuck it out well i chuck it out uh, but those early days if you want to use it go for it if they're in a sling mm. um, if they're in a cast yep. in that position or if it's an acl day week one something like that i don't i don't mind i don't have a protocol because i don't use it too much i don't use any machine pretty much Hardly put my hands hands on doing massage and that type of stuff. But you hardly put your hands on to massage. I hardly do hands on work. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. So I don't. I don't. In the other, in my normal clinic, I do a bit, but say in a strength conditioning scenario where everyone's athletes, I don't. I hardly do any of that. So For I sure. get a move and I empower them. Yes. I empower them as much as Fuck possible. Fuck yeah! The movement. Um. I'm gonna keep going on this ice thing, because you're into it. I love it. I, I fucking. Big notes, big, um, because I think it's like we got to understand why and like question it. Because having another person like with your experience to bounce off it, well, am I not seeing something here? Mm. What is the gray area here? Um, 
When tissue is damaged, the immune system initiates inflammatory response, which a 2010 study published in the Federation of blah, 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 a journal showed is necessary to heal damaged tissue and repair muscle. The body deploys its repair and cleanup crew in the form of macrophages, white blood cells that engulf and digest cellular debris. They produce protein, insulin like growth factor one, which is required for muscle repair and regeneration. The same, same study showed that blocking inflammation inflammation delays healing and prevents the release of igf1 so that's we can apply that theory to like how icing can delay mm. healing because of igf1 pathway being blocked ice delays this process by constricting blood vessels allowing less fluid to reach the injured site as demonstrated in this 2013 journal of strength conditioning research the research showed that topical cooling delays recovery from eccentric exercise induced muscular damage additionally Arthroscopy showed that narrowing of blood vessels caused by icing persists after cooling ends, resulting in restriction of blood flow that can kill otherwise healthy tissue. That is icing causing more damage on top of an existing injury. What do you make of that? I think it makes sense. That, it does make sense. That's what I think. It's just, it's just a uh, different way to think about it, really. Yeah, and like this idea of like, Swelling is bad. No, swelling yeah. is just waste at the end of an inflammatory cycle. Mm. We got to get that waste through. Mm. Move, motherfucker. Mm. And there's and there's different different ways you can, like the rest of that rice. You got compressed. You got elevate. There's still ways that you can help with trying to get a little bit of swelling and that type of thing. It Bro, doesn't have to be ice. There's meth, peace, and love. Yeah. <laughs> do, 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 what do you mean? Yeah. Do you even know what I'm talking about? Meth, peace, and love. <laughs> <laughs> meth. You went way along with that. You're like, yeah, man. <laughs> You're so supportive. <laughs> Tell me. You have a kid one day, you, this kid's going to just spurt some just <laughs> nonsense. Yeah, hey, hey, do your thing. That's peace and love. Man, that's me. Um, movement, elevation, traction, heat. Meth. Movement, elevation, traction. I don't know what he means exactly by traction. What is it? This is a John Paul uh, Calton heat. Zaro. Heat. Yes. I don't know the research... Of if you're going to chuck meth out, you got to know why. So do some more research and bring <laughs> me back heat. That's ha, hold on. Yeah, okay, sorry. Because if we know icing is on one end, if we know if we know the, the, the negative effects of icing, for inflammation and healing and repair and remodeling, mm-hmm. well, theoretically, we could apply the opposite end of heat. And then, okay, why heat? Well, blood flow. Um, could it help us move fluid through the body, through the increase in heart rate, through the increase in total body temperature? I'm talking about a sauna, mm. for example. Mm. We know the benefits of sauna and decreasing all-cause mortality, at, uh, releasing heat shock proteins that decrease total inflammation in the mm. body, systemic inflammation. But the question is, how can we apply heat, like a heat pack, up and down the area? It may not be to the actual site, mm. but it could be up and down like a muscle stem. It's interesting. Something I never thought about. You never thought about heat? With acute muscle injuries, no. Nah. Probably because I've been taught the opposite. Please, go ahead, tell me. What are they, what's their perspective on heat? Just heat's more of something that you do uh, after the acute phase. You, let's just say someone comes in with a, go back to lower back because lower back's easy. Yeah. Uh, that someone's got a, uh, a tight low back that's been that's going on for a while, that's when uh, you're taught to, all right, apply heat if you want to because it's going to loosen up the muscles. Do you have a duration that you wait? Or is it just until the swelling goes down? I don't, I don't use heat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you wouldn't use it in an acute phase for a while. You'd use it more on a chronic situation. That's what you're kind of taught. More chronic, you'd use heat. Super acute, you use ice. That's kind of what you're taught. What about a muscular, what about a spasm? What about tension, uh, high tone? Do you see the utility of heat? I don't really see the utility of heat at all. <laughs> Do you, have you been in a sauna before? I mean, for, if someone's coming in to see me, I'm not getting them to use heat. I'm, I'm in the gym working. No, but no, no, no. In their own time. I'm talking about homework. Uh, I'm talking about the habits because we certainly see our, our guys for a couple hours a week, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd rather them go into, if we're talking about a sauna or something like that, I'd rather them go into a sauna than just apply heat. Right. If they want to apply heat and it feels good, fucking go for it. Right. 
But, that, but that's how you are. You, yeah. you are. See, that's why I like you, Jordan Radliff, because, and that's why I wanted to have you on, because, like, you're an open-minded motherfucker, and, and, like, you, how do I say, you're not extremely, you're not very disagreeable. Like, you're, you have a tendency to be agreeable, you have a tendency to be, to be polite and cordial and, and respectable about your approach and how you conduct yourself. Man, I'm just like, I, got, I, want, I want to talk to this motherfucker. Sit down and have a chat. That's what we're doing now, baby. Talk some chimps. <laughs> Sorry, got off. You don't you don't use hate, so you can't really speak on it much. Um, no, I don't prescribe it. Um, if there's someone that likes hate, say in the normal clinic that I work at, mm. someone someone's away. I'm, someone like me. Someone like you. Fucking love hate. You love hate. If you came in, you said my normal physio um, at the end of a session gives me hate for five minutes, and I fucking love it. That's what I'm gonna do for the last five minutes of the session. And I think when you see enough of those outlier individuals, you start to build patterns. I'm like, all right, so there's something here. Mm. It could be like a, like, do you see that? Have you like built patterns where like clients will come to you with things you don't really heard or know much about, but you start building like, all right, this could be really effective. Yeah, it has to like, again, it's N equals one. Everyone, everyone's totally different. But if someone comes in and they like that, another person comes in, they they like that type of treatment. Um, I think it's more of again their past experience what they've had before and that everything I reckon everything relates back to what we talked about at the very start is past experience if someone likes heat they, they would have had heat before their old physio or whatever would have given heat they have a positive association yeah, yeah. and that's where the placebo fit comes into play quite Oof. a lot placebo it works yeah and so the I think like that's a positive result mm. how much does it matter whether it was placebo or whether it was it was the other thing whether it was the foam roll or it was the placebo mm. doesn't matter does it yeah no not at all you can some people will say it doesn't matter yeah i'm trying to like is, as long as you as long as you're getting a, a good result like if they're foam rolling and they're training really well fuck yeah foam roll every time another acronym is peace protect elevate avoid anti-inflammatory modalities do you what do you have any uh what's your two cents on like yeah. non steroidal anti inflammatory interrogatory drugs? Oh actually, um definitely not early. You never use them early. Mm-hmm. But um I don't mind them. Do yeah. you so what do you see the usefulness with them? Um number one to help with some inflammation and number two to um help pain levels. So I'd never give them for the first week. Yeah. And that's normally when it's at it. That's when the healing process is going on um, the most. Um, if it's something that hangs around, I'd get them to talk to their chemist or talk to um, whoever, their doctor or whatever, if they want to get some anti-inflammatory type stuff um, and follow the guidelines. So why would the, the pain, I understand, if someone's in debil- debilitating pain, it's like, I need this to stop. Mm. I understand. Mm. But why would we want to reduce inflammation? Um and that's exactly what I've learned today. Right, that's the conversation, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and yeah, this is me still talking. Right. I get it. I guess of what I what I've done before. We've had this conversation about yeah. icing. Well, from what I'm learning is that if you remember from physiology, there's a pathway called COX two. Mm. COX two uh, helps release prostaglandins, which are chemical messengers, and these chemical messengers help kind of they're like inflammatory signaling um, molecules, and so. When we take NSAIDs, we reduce the COX-2 pathway, right? And so we don't get as many of these like immune system regulating factors out. And so we're down-regulating these important pathways that are mm. important in the repair and heal process. That's inf- that inflammation helps, right? Mm. And so that's kind of potentially a mechanism behind why maybe, all right, let's be careful about where we yeah. use them. Um, yeah, very true. But other than that, and again, I think it's the way that I've always done it is yeah. if someone doesn't like taking any inflammatories, you're not going to tell them to take it. If someone's had an experience where it's helped, there you go. And that's what I've gone off before. But I guess after having this conversation, ice and anti-inflammatories um, can affect healing um, time, processes, um, regeneration. And I've got to start to think about those things more. Right. Because has there been other things like that that you've had in the past and be like that have like clicked and be like, okay. I gotta look at this. Um, not that I can think of, but fuck, constantly, I reckon. Nothing you can think of at the top of your head. No, nothing, nothing like that. That I've had such a like. This is what I do, and then you can change it. Um, 
fuck, but probably a lot of things. You're right. Const- I'm constantly learning. Like every time I read something, every time I listen to a podcast, I'm constantly learning. And I would have done stuff completely different. Um, then someone would have taught me something or I've been to a course that's taught me something different and yeah. I've changed my approach a little bit. Yeah. Um, but fuck, I think that happens to everyone constantly, man. Can you explain, um, I wanted to go back to ACLs because you were the first one to explain the difference between a, a copra and a non copra And people have this idea and I sent you a video of actually Joe Rogan talking with one of his guests about just just get the ACL surgery, just, mm. just get it fixed, mm. right? But we've seen and we've done and you've shown that you don't need an ACL mm. to perform athletic movement. Mm. Can you explain why and the differences and how you know if you're that person? Yeah. Well, this is big. Uh, yeah. Well, after, after your ACL's ruptured, uh, most people just go for surgery. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the norm is in Australia. I think in Scandinavia, it's kind of 50-50. Fuck, it's Scandinavia. Yeah. What's up? That's what's up. That's what's up. But um, they come up with terms, cobras and non cobras Cobras are someone that can handle the demands of what they need to do without an ACL, okay? Because we know um, an ACL does is that anterior shear force, mm-hmm. yeah? Here's your tibia, here's your femur, that anterior shear force. Um, your hamstrings can actually, if they're strong enough, they, they can help with that, that stability. Well, your hamstrings are a main part, but you've got your quads, you've got everything else. And we see right. that anterior shear force in landing, deacceleration, sprinting, uh, change of direction. Yeah, well, 70% of ACLs are non-contact. Uh, happening from that that landing that changes directions everything like that yeah yep. so that's a large eccentric load going through those quads yes yeah um, so find out if you're copa or non copa all you got to do is just a real good rehab if you if you go through or, or a prehab if you want to call it if you go through a good exercise um, program of of let's just say three months four months five months whatever you want to do and the person is strong enough that they can land well, they can change directions, they can kick a footy, soccer ball, whatever they're doing, playing netball, um, and they feel stable, they're a copa, yeah? A non-copa is just someone that's gone through that whole process, um, but gets to the point where they're like, number one, they're, all right, this is starting to give way a little bit, I'm not feeling like it's totally strong, okay? That's not only gonna affect them physically, but mentally as well. Yeah, if they're if they're not confident, they're going to get to a point. Even if their knee's feeling pretty good, they're going to be like, "No, nah, I want surgery." So that's where ACL is not only a physical game but a mental game. Mm. All right. So a cope is someone that's physically strong and mentally strong. They feel like they can go back and do whatever. Yeah, they're not worrying about their knee at all. They don't know. They don't know what injured. What one? What one of their knees is injured? Pretty much. Yeah. Whereas your non cope is someone that's gone through this whole rehab. Um, and just gets to the point where they're like, I feel like it's given away or I'm not confident or anything like that, okay? A non cobra has just done a really good prehab, mm. yeah? They're ready to go for surgery if they want to go for surgery um, and then they just, they're in a better state for when they come out, all right? The only reason why we can't find out if someone's a cobra or non cobra is uh, professional sport. They, mm. they don't have the time to mm. go through a three-month rehab or prehab to find out that they still need surgery. Because of the risk, because if they do, great. Mm. If, mm. For the non-copers, it's great, yeah. but it's the risk for the... Yeah. Sorry. For the copers, it's great. For the copers, it's... For the yeah. risk of the non-copers, yeah. it doesn't work. Yep. Yeah. And the only the only reason why a professional athlete will do that is if, say, if they're, in, um, if they're an older athlete, they've got one year to go, um, they don't feel like they're going to get another contract, something like that where they've got something else going on, um, that they're the ones that will just go for it. Fuck it. Let's go for it. Yeah, so that's that's the only way that you're really gonna find out if you're a copa or non copa. Okay, there's a lot of people that are um, sub elite or just recreational that will just go for um, the conservative approach where they don't get a reconstruction uh, because we know we can get as strong as possible around that knee that uh, there's gonna be stability. Yeah, that there should be stability. Yeah, not everyone's gonna have it, but there's a lot of people can try. Yeah, and a lot of people's goals change going through their rehab as well. Someone that's playing netball that's got, let's say a female playing netball that's got one kid, two kids or whatever, she might figure out that she doesn't actually want to play netball anymore. But she's just gone through a good rehab. She's got no ACL, but she can do whatever she wants. Yeah. She can still go for a run. She can mm-hmm. go to the gym. She can do a thing and keep moving. Uh, and a lot of these, these guys uh, that are working 
flat out. They're working away sometimes or doing whatever. They they get to the end of their um, their rehab without getting surgery, and they're like, all right, I don't actually want to play footy anymore. I just want to keep working. I want to go to the gym. I want to do my thing. So there's lots of ways um, to go about it, but there's only you've just got to really you got to do it. You got to try it. You got to try it. But too many people see someone go down in sports and say, "Fuck, they're out for twelve months. They got to get a reconstruction." Right. It doesn't have to be that way. We've got to start to start to think about more, start to talk about this conservative approach a lot more. Where there is people like that Kieran Richardson, I think he's from Perth, he's a physio. Uh, Mick Hughes talks about it a lot. There's different physios that are talking about it, but still the thing to do is let's go for surgery. Right, that's a tradition, that's that's the model that they've, that the uh, they've society has knows, right? Yeah. But I don't think, this is the one I want to talk about and bring it up, because I think it's so important you explain that. Yeah. I don't think most people even know they can function without an ACL, Yeah. right? Yeah. Do you apply this with other cruciate ligaments? Do you apply it to MCL, PCL, LCL? Can you apply the same principle or no? Um, Was it penned? Well, I think your ACLs, uh, ACL and PCL um, just won't heal as well as your MCL. If you rupture your MCL and you get in a good position, you don't, you don't need to get reconstructed. It can heal on its own. Your ACL actually heals on its own over a long period of time. Um, but you just don't do as severe. Um, it's not as catastrophic doing your MCL, your LCL, or, or yeah, your MCL, your LCL compared to your ACL. Your PCL. ACL is the most catastrophic. Yeah. Tier one, number yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, what we often see images portrayed is you know you'll see that ACL almost like this fibrous band of tissue mm. like rotates around mm. and it just snaps off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that every case or is it like partial? Yeah, you can get partials, yeah. So partial can repair itself more easily? Yeah, definitely. It still takes time and you've got to have the good bulk surrounding it. With the full tear, mm. you're telling me, you know, there could be a couple millimeters in there where it's torn off each other. Mm. You're telling me that it can regrow onto itself. Yeah, there's been studies or cases of uh, ACLs rehealing. So someone that's, that's gone- That's amazing. Someone that's gone from oh, a shit. conservative approach and let's just, let's go back to the female netballer um she's gone conservative approach she's just done good exercise she's just gone back um just gone back to work going back for runs going back to the gym do whatever she wants let's say two three years later uh, her knee starts to hurt um she decides to get an mri and they find in the uh, mri scan that fuck all right this acl is actually healed she's like yeah i've got a complete rupture from acl and then the surgeons like all the doctors or whatever that acl is healed so there's cases of that. That's amazing. Which is so interesting. But multi-year we're talking, like a slow oh, yeah. multi-heal yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and that's like, wow, man. It, it, is it, do you know what it's made from? Is it made from uh, collagen? Is it, do, we, do, you, do you know? Just a ligament. Um, yeah. Fuck. That's okay. Because yeah. um, I'm, like, I'm thinking like, because a lot of uh, fibrous tissue and connective tissue or connective tissue, especially fascia, it's, it's partly made of collagen. And mm. so like, I'm thinking like, well, I take a collagen protein mm. supplement. I'm like, all right, how can we think about like other ways to help improve joint healing and mm. ligament and tendon healing, like collagen supplementation. But fuck, there's no research. It's just mm. a theory. Number two. So yes, it can apply to other cruciate ligaments in the knee. Okay, great. ACL's top tier. Number two uh, would be duration. What is the duration yeah, and that's of a that hard one. Stage. Yeah. You well, said three months? Of, of to find out if you're a copra or non copra? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd go three months. But then let's say you're a copra and you want to get back to sport, mm-hmm. that's where there's not heaps of research and you've gotta be pretty much N equals one there. You've got to find out, all right, um, do they tick at the same boxes uh, as an ACL? Um, what's their running mechanics like? What's their acceleration, um, deceleration, max um, speed, what's it change of direction? You go through everything exactly the same. I would have a tendency to think you would tick pretty similar boxes because those boxes... You, you tick the exact same boxes, but it, I think a time frame um, is the hardest thing. Because, yeah. Because there's, there was that one study of that professional soccer player, and I think he got back in nine weeks. Whoa. Maybe. Nine? Maybe, yeah. Maybe Bro. between nine and 12. Full contact? Yeah, playing EPL. Did he re-injure? Or is uh, it too, long, too short to say? No, this was ages ago. This was a while ago. Uh, I don't know if you... I don't think it re-injured because there was such a big... Um, there's so much talk about it that I don't think he re-injured. I think he played at a decent level over the next two seasons. This is professional soccer? Yeah, English Premier League, dude. Wow. But this is the thing. Just to know that's even possible. Yeah. Just to... Even the possibility that, look, there is someone out there, there are people out there that we can 
go back to perform, yeah. recover, regenerate, and do our thing without. I mean, I don't know. I've never had a serious injury. I've never gone into surgery. How much is a, a knee surgery like that? How much? Yeah, do you know? Oh, it depends if you're on public, private. Like, let's just say, fuck. It can, if it's private, you can get up to probably more than 10 grand. I don't know. Yeah. Six, if, it's, if it's public, you're on a waiting list for a long period of time. Yeah. It just gets done. But if you want, all right, this is a surgeon I want. It's going to be expensive. It's a lot of money, man. And for a lot of people, like their sport is their life. And so yeah. they're like, they, they make ends meet and they yeah. just, they make it work. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is you can try another option that can save you and your family a lot of money mm. and puts less pressure on the medical system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, that's the thing too. There's too many people going for ACLs that don't actually need an ACL. Really? Yeah. Like if you just want to go for runs go to the gym yeah. just go to work right. why do you need an ACL yeah we know the uh, arthritis rates are super similar so what what's the benefit of getting your ACL you've got, you've got to go through you got to take time off work um, it costs a lot of money you're going through uh, some serious fucking rehab like there's a lot of things that, there's a lot of cons that come with getting surgery mm. yeah the only con that I can think of with um, conservative approach is the unknown. But shit, look, you got to embrace that at the end of the day. Just yeah. the fact you got to. I think you, I just encourage my client. Remember, like, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. All right, yeah. you're a non copa Yeah. At least we tried. And now you've got a real strong knee. Yeah. And you're ready to go for you're surgery. You're better prepared. We've yeah. got a head start. Yeah. On the surgery, you'd probably be better prepared for surgery. You're probably gonna. Yeah. Uh, wish we've started immediately. Hundred percent, and that's what I try and get across to everyone. But the hardest thing is, the cycle is all right. I've done my knee. I'll go to the doctor. I'll get an MRI. I'll go back to the doctor. He'll send me to um, a surgeon. The surgeon books me in for surgery, and that's it. There's no one. There's none of us in between. Sometimes there is if someone's. Oh, that's true. If someone's smart enough. They come into you after they already got yeah. the surgery. Yeah. Because that's what they think. Yeah. Coaching, physio, yeah. after surgery. Yeah. Guess what, motherfuckers? You don't have to. <laughs> no way. Have you been able to successfully intervene at any point like that? Uh, we have some clients, yeah. Definitely. We've got... Uh, we had two that was in the ACL class um, last year, middle of last year, that didn't have ACLs. And they just continued without an ACL. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, some at the just the other clinic I work at, but but not not enough, nowhere near enough compared to what we get after they've gone for their surgery. What assessments are you looking at in that stage that you want to successfully tick to see that they're a copa? How do you know? Uh, mainly, it's just again you're looking at just your quad strength, your hamstring strength relative right to left. Um, you can even get them doing some drop jumps, you can get them doing some hops, you can um, see how they're accelerating, decelerating, see what they change the directions like. How quickly would you do that? Uh, I reckon depending. If, they, if they're if they going, if they've got a good foundation, then you can progress that pretty quick. But if it's someone that's never been in the gym before, you're gonna yeah. stay in that gym for a while. For sure. Yeah, you're gonna build them up until they're pretty confident um, in their knee and you're confident in how they're moving. Mm. Once that happens, you can start to get them onto some pogo, some plyometric work. Once they're working well in their plyometric type stuff, then you, the demands of that are, are closer to running that type of stuff. Is the plyos you would incorporate a couple of weeks in, a month in, two months mm. in? Good, good question. It's if, if they're landing well. So I always do the absorption stage first. Landing like how quickly are you going to do a, a landing work? So I'll do a tall, I'll do a tall to short pretty early. So I'll do that. Let's say with those who don't know tall to short. How how would you describe it? You start upright. Yeah, on your toes. Yep. Come down, land. Come down. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Athletic base. Simple. Yep. I'll um, I'll do that double leg pretty early. If 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 they're feeling confident in that, uh, progress that onto um, a single leg. Yep. Yeah. Progress that up onto a box. Do the same thing nice. there. Then start to. Uh, go into the more plyometric stage where they're doing a pause box jump, counter movement jump, add some weight to the counter movement jump, that yep. type of thing. Just I love it because it's such a it's such a nice linear progression that just makes a, it's structured, mm. makes a lot of sense. Mm. Like of how we're going from increasing load tolerance yeah. slowly, yeah. complexity, motor control, and then the whole time you've got to be talking why we're we doing this. If they're working on their um, 
on their absorption, which is pretty much your deceleration when you're going to change directions or something like that. Yeah, so you're starting to work those quads eccentrically and then say, why are we landing the athletic base? Because then we can go wherever we need to go. If you're talking them through what you're doing uh, in your exercises, it yep. makes that translation onto the field a lot easier. Because if you're going through and you're getting to do all these exercises without explaining, they're like, why the fuck am I doing this? Why am I just landing? Like, you got to make them care. Yeah, you've got to say, all right, this is how this relates to change of direction. Um, if you're going through your running mechanics, this is how it relates to actual running. Like, you've just got to explain stuff really well and people will stick with you for a long period of time. Yeah. I think and the, the, one of the best one about the athletic base is like, all right, everybody can relate to it. Mm. Center of mass. Yeah. Try and push someone over standing up. Yeah. Drop your hips down. Try yeah. and push me over. Yeah. It's harder to push you over. Yeah. Ha- that translates in an unlimited fashion yeah. to day-to-day life and unle- athletic movement. Yeah. Like, it's easy. That's super effective. So you have those assessments. You have the landing, the pliers. I know you got a coach soon. We'll wrap it up soon. We have those. You have those assessments. And then what if they don't, like how are you seeing it if they don't cope? Like, what's that picture look like? I think if they don't cope, um, it looks like, number one, they're mentally not... Subjectively, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Um, they, they, I reckon they can still do quite well in, in a, in a um, quad test or a hamstring yeah. test. Um, it's more when you start to get to, let's say, a single leg drop jump or if they've got to do, um, if they've got to do a single leg hop they're going to have massive differences because number one, they feel like their knee's going to give way um, and they don't have the confidence to to really do that jump. And some of them would say, I, I just don't feel confident doing this. How much do you think that is psychological? Is there, is there like you can intervene and be like, trust yourself, like that you can yeah. kind of talk them up a little yeah. bit? Oh, definitely. Yeah, you, you can definitely try that. But at the end of the day, if someone feels like their knee's giving yeah. way, I've, I've, I've got someone now that's, a year post and just because that person's not psychologically strong enough or she's the person's not just confident in her knee that's it makes it a lot harder Mm. so yeah definitely is a and it's a large part of an ACL rehab that's why we think of any ACL rehab is also a a brain type rehab too because we're trying to rewire the injury normally happened for a reason unless it was a unlucky contact or something like that. Yeah. It normally happens for a reason. Let's get to the cause yeah. and so, let's work around that. So we're doing a lot of reactive type stuff as well to try and rewire, to get them in good position, to get them confident in the game. What do you see as the biggest causes to knee injuries like ACL injuries? I reckon it's just bad preparation. They don't have that foundation. No one's in Australia, well, most people in Australia have never been taught how to run, change direction, anything like yeah. that. So I think it's having a real good foundation. If you've got a good foundation, uh, a lot of these injuries won't occur, especially the 70% that's non-contact. Yeah, if they understand how to change directions, if they're proactive rather than reactive, build a good foundation, have all these mechanics, they're going to be super unlucky if they do an ACL injury. Right. Uh, you know you've done the work. Yeah. You know you've done everything you can, yeah. but most people don't do it. No. Most clubs don't invest in yeah. coaching and SNC. No. No way. But most people have a physio or myo to rub them down. Yeah, yeah, to rub them down. Yeah, right. What's that doing? Well, we talked about it earlier, right? It's not doing nothing, but it's what could else we'd be doing? Yeah. What do you think is the future of, of you and, and this industry? Just keep building what I'm doing, I reckon. Um, understanding how important the the coaching side is in in what I do. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've learned so much about best thing about physio i think is i've learned so much about how to diagnose what what pain is how complex pain is uh, that side of it but what i've learned in s and c is how to all right i can educate them there but now let's start to implement a good program for them let's educate them well on this side as well so then this isn't going to happen again so i think i want to keep building my s and c side and slowly keep ramping that up i see that with you man like do you call yourself a coach you call yourself SC coach? Um, it's a weird thing for you. Yeah, no, I don't. I call myself physio, but I feel like, especially here, I'm, I'm just a coach. Right. Because I see you on the floor. Co- like, you take them early stage, you take them middle stage, you take them end stage. Mm. Like, that's what you want. Yeah. That's a weapon. Yeah. You can take them throughout that whole range. Yeah. And like, Jordan Radley, physiotherapist, 
there's got to be like a hybrid word you can use a physiotherapist coach physiotherapist SNC coach just keep it keep it easy yeah I'm a physio and I'm a strength coach <laughs> <laughs> but that's it <laughs> like you have that such broad spectrum application now and that's what I think a lot of people are starting to do yeah because it's needed yeah yeah the you only get so far if you want to do if, if you want to do early stages perfect be a physio yeah if you want to work with chronic low backs that type of thing perfect be a physio but if you want to work with let's say athletes that are going from first day of rehab to last day of rehab you've got to have two things you can't just be a physio for that mm. you've got to have a real you've got to have a compliment you've got to have a compliment a, at least yeah. somebody you're working with yeah to yeah, outsource exactly, exactly. Is there something you wish us knew more, like us health professionals, coaches, could take from your expertise and experience? I just think um, everyone's got to work together. Yeah, I reckon that's the most important thing: is know when to refer, um, and know know who to refer to. Pretty much, if if you've got a good team around you, it's it's easy. If if you if someone comes to you and they're injured, you're going to send them to me. Yeah. Yeah, if that, then I, as soon as I get that person out of injury, I'll send them straight back to you. Mm. So it's that referral process. If everyone works together um, and just do your job really well and let the other person do their job really well. Yeah. Right. So I reckon just working as a team, because um, unless you want to go back and be a physio and, and learn more about the diagnosis, the pain, that type of thing, there's, there's, there's no point you trying to work with someone in pain. You know what I mean? that make sense say it again if if you want to work with someone that's in high levels of pain yeah with and you don't know what their injury is are you going to send them to an allied health professional or are you going to try and do it yourself right you want to fill the gaps yeah and send them yeah accordingly and if you want to be able to do that fuck yeah go and study a little bit more but you can also like like i've done i can you, i can sit in with you yeah yeah, yeah. tell Very me how true. you think about this yeah, yeah right let's let's because then we can integrate. Yeah. That's it. So referral. Referral. Work together. Work together. Or if you want to do it all, just go back and study a little bit. And just more. be be the weapon. Yeah. Like you're becoming. Slowly. Slowly. Anything else you want to talk about? No. That's it. You wanna promote anything? No. Nah. You got a book? <laughs> <laughs> you know they were finish off selling got, their books. I got no book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man, for being on this. I appreciate you. No worries, man. Good chat. Anytime. Talking chimps, baby. Love that. Legend. See you, chimps. Woo!